Hello, and welcome to Scott's Odyssey. During a time with a lull in cultural growth for the arts and explosively fast expansions into the sciences, the dawn of the 20th century brought with it many interesting societal changes. This site is one of them. Today we find ourselves in one of the very first iterations of modern living, a slowly poured slab of cold hard concrete with no signs of feeling or warmth, just indestructible cubicles portraying our future lives in a dystopian community. Welcome to the Concrete City. See you in a minute. Welcome back. If you've watched my videos before, thank you for your patronage. And if you're new to Scott's Odyssey, welcome aboard. Please give a click on that like, and don't forget to click the subscribe for more Odyssey stories of who we once were. This gets that message out to YouTube to give the video rank, and it promotes it toward people who have an interest in these types of topics. Make sure you jump out to my Patreon or to the Odyssey Merchandise Store in order to help keep this channel going. Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, the Wyoming Valley, one of the first locations to create and bring the future makings of America to the world, and home to the largest deposits of anthracite coal, or as it was better known to the world, the fuel of the Industrial Revolution. It was during a time when the separation of people was no longer that of the educated noble and servant but now was shifting into the inventor, the investor, the innovator, white collar and blue collar workers. The limits of humanity were no longer bound by a bloodline, but rather whatever you could imagine, you could become. Nothing was a free ride though, and your position in society was based on how you could make the world a better place by what you could offer, not who you were. But this new type of culture came at a grave price. If you could not offer an improvement, you were essentially doomed to perish. This brought out the dog-eat-dog -dog work ethic in everyone and the ability to effectively create something better, faster, stronger, more able to save resources in the long run was what made you a proverbial king of the industry. Welcome to the progressive era. In 1911, during an existential dilemma of institutionalized architecture, a new way of building homes was emerging. Located just outside of Nanticoke on the southern end of Pennsylvania's northern anthracite uplands, the Delaware, Lackawanna and Western Railroad Company, or DL&W, had a division specifically dedicated to coal transport. In this specific location, they founded what would be referred to as the Garden City, a company town built using new methods and models for industrial housing and efficiency. Their methods and implementation quickly became an industry acclaimed model for future-proof building processes, and since have been referred to as an example of international style architecture. If you remember, during 1902, we saw in another video concerning Altoona and the Horseshoe Curve that a strike in the coal and steel industries rocked America, and the formation of unions finally found their place when people realized, although to the greed of the union organizers, that they could control how businesses operate above and beyond what the owners of the companies had intended. Sometimes this went well for the benefit of the safety and fairness of the people, and sometimes it gave cause for company owners to shut down their doors forever, leaving those same people starving and homeless. But in both situations, the union organizers sat like fat cats licking their fur in the end. Well, the progressive plague spread quickly and unprecedented growth of labor unions formed, creating the situations for welfare legislation, food inspection, drug laws, and many other good ideas that impose directly on the individuals seeking to work for a living when dressing themselves up as taking down the people referred to as the robber barons. But this is not a political channel. Giving a well-constructed and historically backed opinion, just someone pointing out that this is the facts and the truth of what actually happened during those times. Another name given to this time period, although not often found 
uh, referenced in modern day institutionalized indoctrination found with the education system. Although a name that factually represents 1910 through 1915 is the age of efficiency, reflecting on the determinations made by Frederick Winslow Taylor's scientific management, sometimes called Taylorism. Taylorism was an idea that efficiency could be applied to any aspect of life, specifically in the workplace. So that's where he focused. It makes your business much more efficient and saves you money. Unfortunately, the concept was up against a large number of business owners trying to keep ahead of their competition and against the raging unions trying to knock more money out of their pockets and into the hands of the workers, which led to modifications of Taylorism that could also be applied to the building of home, communities, schools, and even religious institutions. <laughs> Insert America's first taste of totalitarian dystopian socialism in its purest form, where the owner of a company sought to keep as much ownership under the pressure of decentralization by his own employees. Now, I know, this is a lot of heavy weight put into a video regarding a site where there's a bunch of crumbling concrete buildings. But as I always do in all of my videos, I bring to you the truth and recorded facts of what was taking place right here when this was built and what it was for. DLNW was the most powerful and largest company in the anthracite railroad industry and any way to save money through efficiency while keeping the union dogs at bay was a boon to their position. The implementation of efficiency, including that of their Garden City, took them from an asset value of $50 million in 1900 to a whopping $295 million by 1924. Back to the Concrete City. The ability to gain housing with a company that you worked for is what a normal practice would have been going back to the early 1700s. It was almost normal and expected that you would have a place for you and your family provided by the company you worked for, and possibly some clothing or staple allowances as well as a modest salary to pay for your work and build your retirement opportunity, or at least get you through hard times when work was slow. Well, it was not much different in 1911, where many companies were still providing housing as an incentive. As a matter of fact, this trend remained in place with green bar neighborhoods all the way up to and including the 1970s, where companies would provide you access to prefabricated developments specific to employees and former employees of large industrial companies. Back to 1911. Housing was part of your salary, a benefit if you will, and depending on your rank and file within the company would depend on which part of the community or which type of living space would be provided to you, something you will only see on American military posts in our current time. Believe it or not, this is why today almost all houses within a community and all operations of an educational system look exactly the same. It's based on a bastardization of Taylorism and the worker bee mentality of the late 19th, early 20th century mentality of industrialized factory working. That brings us back to the concrete city. In September of 1911, on a 39-acre tract of land in a lot that was 375 feet by 430 feet, 20 duplex homes of poured concrete were constructed. The original number was to be 40 homes, but only 20 were ever poured. The homes were built around a rectangular quad and all faced inward toward their central park. The quad itself was designated as a central park and contained multiple playground amusements, as well as a circular wading pool for the children and a waste pool for the adults, a baseball diamond and tennis courts. Each building consisted of two stories, with a footprint for each of the two families living space being 25 by 50 feet on a 40 by 150 foot lot, leaving space for those who wished to and were urged to grow a small garden. The roof was also made of poured concrete and covered with slag. The houses were finished off with port of fenet windows or French windows that did not have a center post like a casement window. They had rain gutters, downspouts, and even a wire-hung marquee concrete slab over the door. Surprisingly, these buildings also included a cellar. 
Inside the buildings were preformed concrete walls with a layout separating your pantry, kitchen, dining room, living room, porch, and main electrical closet. There was no water closet or as what we now call a bathroom. Instead, there was an outhouse behind every building. And this is important to remember for later on in the story. The second floor consisted of three bedrooms. Two were 11 foot six by 12 foot six inches in size, and one was much smaller at six foot 10 by 11 foot three in size. There was a second six foot 10 by 11 foot three room that was not designated as a chamber or bedroom, but rather an enclosed porch. There are a total of four closets on the second floor, but oddly enough, one is listed as a three-step unused closet in the floor plan. And based on its location, it's quite possible that it was originally intended as a manner in which to get to the roof of the building to use the roof maybe as an outdoor patio. But the plans never worked out to punching a hole in the middle portion of the roof, which kind of makes sense when it comes to controlling water flow issues when it's raining or snowing. The kitchen had a building coal stove for cooking and heating, and there was another pot belly coal stove located in the middle of the building just for heating. Also in the kitchen was a mid-sized concrete tub for washing of clothes and of your person after you heated the water on the kitchen coal stove. Your water for drinking, cooking, washing, and bathing was all obtained from a central water fountain located in the middle of the park. The materials for the building of this site were brought in directly on the DL and W lines, and the concrete was actually mixed on the flat cars using them as molds, a design innovation and efficiency put forth by the uh, Rand and Merrill engineering firm in New York. Because of the grand efficiency of it all, it only took one day to build a complete two-story duplex building. Let me know in the comments below if you know of stories and locations such as this one. My research is limited only by the information that people don't share openly. Help me break that barrier and let's share the history and culture of who we once were. In order to be put on a waiting list for these homes, you had to speak English as your first language and you had to be employed by the Truesdale Colliery working in the DL&W Railroad Company's division and you had to be in a position of high value where high value meant you were a shopman, foreman, technician, or supervisor, and if you moved in, you were required to purchase a lawnmower. The price to live in this pseudo-utopian company was a rent of $8 per month, or equivalent to $223 in 2021 money, and it was conditional upon the earlier provisions ending effectively upon your leave or termination from the company. The community did interesting things together, and the company held events for the community promoting beautification of their properties through the annual garden contest with cash prizes. Paint was provided to all tenants in order to repaint their own buildings every two years, and each home was thoroughly cleaned during this time by removing all of the furniture and belongings from inside to outside, and then the inside of the house would get sprayed down and washed down with cleaners and water. Although these homes may seem to have been desirable, there were issues that were left unaddressed when they were presented by the non-unionized community to the company. There were often complaints of the buildings being perpetually damp and cold, which would be commensurate with living in a concrete building. Although the walls were built, including materials such as coal cinders and crude oil to inhibit moisture absorption, Upon investigation, the interior walls would actually drip with condensation. There's even an alleged story that a woman remembers her father's shirts freezing in the upstairs closets during the winter months and her mother ironing them just so that he could put them on every day to go to work. Other complaints of the dampness talk about perpetually recleaning the clothing due to mold and even some people getting respiratory issues due to the mold but that one's a hard call because well they were coal miners many people today can relate to that wet and cold feeling that comes from their poured concrete basements heck 
<laughs> even I remember from the row homes I lived in as a child in Philadelphia that the basement, which is an above ground cellar, was perpetually damp all year and was significantly cooler, if not colder, than the rest of the house. But then again, it was an inner city row home, so technically it was no different than these poor concrete homes of the early 1900s in building style except for the plumbing. Which brings up the next complaint. The poured concrete outhouse conditions were apparently not that great. There was no running water, nor anything beyond a hole in the ground, and that they were beyond frigidly cold during the winter. In the end, of all things, this would become the concrete city's Achilles heel. Other grand wonders of the community featured a tree planted at the front of each building, sidewalks, an actual street made with shale that ran the entire way around the park, community trash bins, flower boxes at each window on the first floor, and electric street lights that illuminated the sidewalks and the shale street. Although built in 1911, people did not start moving in until 1912, and that wonderful waist-deep swimming pool for adults was actually shut down and filled in by 1914 because of a young boy who drowned there. You may think to yourself, how did a little boy drown in such a small community? But at that time of the incident, there were 90 children actually living in this community of only 22 families. And with that many people, accidents are bound to happen. By 1920, Concrete City was starting to suffer many conditions of disrepair. The buildings were cracking, which was allowing for water seepage. The paint was peeling off of the walls, both internally and externally. The park was falling into disuse and lack of upkeep. And the outhouse issue had never been addressed. <laughs> the outhouse issue. You see, it was 1920. Indoor plumbing was a thing now but DL&W wanted nothing to do with updating any of their buildings. It cost $2,500 to build one of these slab buildings, and a new building of brick would only cost $2,100, and you could include steam, heat, and indoor toilets with running water. By 1924, almost every resident had left, and nobody wanted to live here. So DL&W sold their abandoned concrete city to the Glen Alden Coal Company. The Glen Alden Coal Company sought to update and reuse the buildings for their own company town. Remember those outhouses? Well, the township required that outhouse refuse be put into a sewage system for sanitary management. Upon inspection of what would be required to update the buildings with indoor plumbing and the entire town with a proper sewage system, the realization of cost over value sank in deeply and the Glen Alden Coal Company realized it would be far too costly at over $200,000 or more than $3,500,000 in 2021 money just to get the toilets and a sewer system in the 20 homes. So they figured they'd get around this issue by raising the entire town. They initiated it by attempting to raise one of the concrete buildings using 100 sticks of dynamite. Fortunately, and to everyone's surprise, the dynamite had little to no impact. It was at that moment that Glen Alden Coal Company just left the site and it became officially and completely abandoned as a concrete city.
The concrete city has remained a ghost town that was actually completely forgotten for some time and then garnered some public interest again around the late 80s. Since that time, it has been added to the historic sites list in the National Archives and efforts from local groups continue to try to save this site. It is stated that at one point uh, in the 80s, you were able to find the pools on the ground, but due to the local fire departments experimenting with flammable materials for training, those locations are currently buried. Likewise, some people complain that the vandalism of locals and spray painters is causing the deterioration of the buildings faster than nature and local gun enthusiasts have repeatedly shot at the buildings, destroying them even further. Fact of the matter is, if 100 sticks of high explosive did not bring these buildings down, I'm relatively sure that the spray paint or small camping fires in some of the buildings are having little to no effect beyond making the buildings look dirty. As for gunshots, well, it's highly recorded that nobody has ever seen nor caught any of these shooters with their live rounds into these buildings, except for the local police who at one time would come out here to train. I hope you enjoyed the story of the Concrete City. If you haven't already, remember to click like on this video and give me a subscribe for more odd to see stories of who we once were. I thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.